Corinthians 9 and 8, 2 Corinthians 9 and 8 says, God is able, anybody believe He is? Yes. Able to make all grace abound towards you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Isn't that a wonderful verse? Well, does God's grace reach not only in the forgiveness of your sin, but does it also reach to your material life? Yes, sir. Obviously it does. That's what he's talking about. If you read this whole offering, he's talk, this whole chapter, he's talking about an offering, he's talking about giving. And the thing that the Lord brought to my attention was this word sufficiency. And I think we haven't appreciated that word as much maybe as we should because in our vernacular, uh, in usage today, when you hear sufficient, you think pretty much adequate, yeah, right? Adequate. But that's not, th this word means more than that. Listen to the definition. This is Thayer's lexicon. Uh, this word right here, it says it means sufficiency, all sufficiency. It means a perfect condition of life, that's his words, not mine, in which no aid or support is needed. Sufficiency. You have all sufficiency. You remember uh, Paul uh, reaching out to the Lord concerning a situation and the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Again, that we hear that and tend to think it's enough, it's adequate. But no, listen to the definition of that word. It says, uh, when he said, my grace is sufficient for you, that word means to be possessed of unfailing strength. Everybody say unfailing, unfailing. Strength. strength. What does that mean? Never runs out. Yeah. He is the God who never runs out. That's right. That's right. That's right. Somebody say never runs out. Never never runs out. out. And He's your source. Right. Isn't that, let's put that scripture back up 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. Isn't that what, what this describes is never running out? Yeah. Never coming short? God's able. Do you believe He's able? You said he, you do. He's able to do what? To make all grace abound to you to the result that you always have all sufficiency in all things and abound to every good work. I've never heard a better definition of being prosperous, of, of true prosperity. Prosperity is not a dollar amount. Different people need different things. But when you've always got all sufficiency in every area and you got plenty to give. You're blessed. You're prosperous. Right? Is that you? Somebody say, that's me. Go to Isaiah, please. Isaiah, the 40th chapter. Isaiah 40 and verse 25. The Lord says, to whom then will you uh, liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Who are you going to compare uh, to me? Who are you going to find like me? Verse 26, lift up your eyes on high. He's talking about looking into the sky, particularly the night sky. And behold, who has created these things that brings out their host, the heavenly host, by number, and he calls them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one fails. How much power does it take to keep our sun shining? 
How many stars are there out there like that? How much power would it take? Does it take to keep all these stars burning and all these planets in their orbits because God is so powerful, not one fails. Oh, somebody say glory to God. Go to verse 28. Verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, what does everlasting mean? Last forever, right? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He, he never is stumped because he doesn't know what to do. He never is weak and needs to lay down. I mean, you just think about dealing with all of us. And then everybody else that's on the planet. And there are some hard heads on the planet. And so folks that just won't do what he wants them to do, no matter what. And But never after centuries of dealing with all the stuff down here, does God go, I need to sit down. I'm taking tomorrow off. Nobody bother me. I need a break. He never gets weary. He never gets tired. Do you believe that sustaining all the stars and all the planets and all the stuff and at the same time every man, woman, and child on the planet earth could make a demand on his power? Could he answer every prayer and meet every need simultaneously? And the lights in heaven wouldn't even flicker. You believe it? Why? Because he is the everlasting unfailing God who does not run out. Keep reading verse 29. Here's one of the greatest things about him having all this power. He's not greedy with it. He's willing to share it. He's willing to give some to you and to me. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. You feel real weak? You qualify. What? To get strength. To get power. Verse 30, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Why? Why not faint? Because he doesn't faint. Oh, come on, did you hear this, friend? Why? How can I have strength and, and not run out? How can I be uh, quickened so that I don't faint and fall out and perish? Because the God I'm connected to cannot be faint and cannot fall out. Come on, are you listening? Oh, here's what else it means. If he can't run out and I'm connected to him, <laughs> why would I run out? Now, if you go off and do your own thing, well, you can run out easy and quick. But if you're hooked with him and you want what he wants and you're doing what he wants, friend, you should never run out.
my grandmother, who's in heaven now, uh, was everybody called around the house and the community, Sister Lena Pearl. We're from the South. And in the South, you need good double names. In case something, something happens to the, one of the names, you got another real good one right there ready. <laughs> and they, they have to have a flow to them. Kind of a poetic, you know, Billy Bob. <laughs> right? Yes, <sir. laughs> and all of us did. <laughs> Well, my grandmother's Lena Pearl. She was secretary and treasurer of the local Pentecostal church there for, I don't know, de decades and uh, multiple generations she saw and taught. She had dreams and visions, which was much misunderstood. There were some people who said some ugly things about her over some things she, one of the, one of the meekest ladies you'd ever want to be around. You know, and all my time with her, and we used to stay with Grandma after school as little kids every day, and my, both of my parents worked, and, and um, I never heard her use a bad word. I never heard her talk bad about people. Never. Isn't that amazing? So meek and, and, and humble, and, and the Lord would show her things sometime, and man, she didn't want to tell it, but she would out of uh, reverence and fear of the Lord. She'd stand up trembling and tell things in, in the church service. And some people would scoff and mock and ridicule. But I saw over a course of decades, person after person that did it had to come back and repent when it came to pass. I was at her house one day when a grown man, big old guy came and knocked on the door and he was crying. And he came in and knelt at her rocking chair and asked her to forgive him for saying and doing the things he did because what she had seen exactly happened. It took it 20 years. You know, not everything happens overnight. Well, anyway, uh, she were, and, and her mother-in-law, my, my granddad's mom, were close. Her name, we call, well, I, I didn't really know her, but uh, they called her Monetti. <laughs> Monetti Moore. And uh, uh, her husband was Mac Moore. And uh, she told all the kids, I was going to say, had about 12 kids, told them all when she's going to die. The day. The day. Well, there was talk about, you know, how would she know and wonder if that's really going to happen. Well, the day she told them, she went out early that morning and milked the cow, come back in with a pail of milk. When she put her foot up on the first step to go back in the house, fell dead. No sickness, no pain. That's the way to go. Yes. Right? Yes, sir. Yes. And uh, well, the kids and grandkids took it hard. And even weeks and months later, we're not doing well. Well, my grandmother said, and she told me this and others many, many times. I'd ask her to tell me again. She said she, after a long day, she went to the bedroom and lay down at night to, to go to bed. She said as soon as she laid down, as soon as her head hit the pillow, she said she come straight up out of her body whew, and went up, 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 up. She said she was convinced she went to heaven. She said she didn't see a whole lot, but she saw this beautiful staircase, huge, ornamented, and, and I forget how she described it. It sounded like it was sweeping. And up at the top stood her mother-in-law, Ma Nettie. So she went up there, and I guess they embraced and, and, and hugged and, and rejoiced, and she said she didn't look like the last time she saw her. She, she, she wasn't old. She was beautiful and so, so vibrant and young and had this beautiful, I believe she said purple, uh, gown type thing. She said it was just almost beyond description. And she, they began to talk. 
and said, Monetti asked her how everybody was doing since mother had been gone. And she said, well, you know, they're uh, having trouble and getting over this. And she'd been talking to them and praying with them. And then she asked about my grandpa, Molina's husband, my grandpa. His name, Quinnon Nelson. Another good double name. <laughs> and a lot of folks called him QN. Quinnon Nelson. Now, my granddad was not active in the church. He went to church maybe once every year or so if he had to. He was not, you'd ask him, you know, are you a Christian believer? No. He tolerated my grandma. And uh, he was a rough and tumble guy. He worked, he, he worked in, in harsh conditions. I've seen him rip open his hand and arm and just cuss and put a rag on it <laughs> and keep going. Just that kind of guy, but you know, drink, smoke, chew, dip, cuss, just, you know, he was a rough guy and, and not a believer. And my grandmother said, Monetti, which was his mom, looked at him and said, has Quentin changed his way of living since mother has been here? I can see it right now. My grandmother said she hung her head. She said, no, Miss Nettie. I'll have to say no. She said, will you tell him if he wants to see mother again, he better change his way of living. Tell him he's got more stock in heaven since mother is here. And if he wants to see me again, he better change. Isn't that interesting? Is heaven real? Anybody believe heaven is real? You believe we have loved ones and friends and family there? Yes, sir. I might have gone this direction or that direction, but the Lord prompted me and helped me to see him. It's absolutely the truth. I hadn't thought about it like this. But he said, no, the most important thing to a mother is the well-being of a child and to be with the child. Right? And every godly mother or believing mother that's gone on to glory, what do you think is the most important thing to them? That every one of their children be with them yes. and with the Lord in glory, in heaven, forever. Amen. Now, uh, QN <laughs> didn't change the next day or the year or the next 10 or 20 after that. But my grandmother went home before him and that hit him hard. A lot of times people don't realize what, how much spiritual people are holding the family together until they leave. And uh, I'm happy to say that especially like the last, oh, I don't know, three to five years of my granddad's life, he did change. He did change. My dad was able to spend a lot of time with him, praying, talking about the Word, and he, I know he prayed, and my dad stayed with him some, and, and uh, he said he'd hear him in the nighttime praying which for him was. <laughs> so we are so glad that we can expect to see QN <laughs> in heaven too. <laughs> in a lot of ways, he was a good grandpa. He loved us grandkids. Uh, just rough, you know, around the edges. <laughs> like one fellow said, you know, he's uh, what would they say in the Bible? I guess it was that flying show I saw recently. That the guy was a, he was a tough rascal until you got to know him, and then he was still tough. <laughs> that was, that's, that's, that was QN. But that's who Jesus died for, Amen. right? Was people that, all of us that have sinned and come short. Well, I want us to talk about that about every mother and grandmother getting to see their children again in heaven. Is that okay with you? Yes. Let's see. I'll just read some of these to you. I'm going to Psalm 90. Psalm 90 and verse 1. 
Psalm 90 and verse 1, it says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Isaiah 57, 15, don't turn there, just listen to it. 57, 15 says, Thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. What do these words, eternal, everlasting, mean? What does it mean? It means what you think it means. The literal definition is in perpetuity, perpetual. I like one of the Hebrew words for these words is interesting. It means out of sight. <laughs> How long is it? You can't see that far. It's out of sight. But God is, he's from everlasting to everlasting as far back as it is far forward. That's not something we fully understand or that we will fully understand in this life. The scripture says so. Ecclesiastes 3.11, you don't have to turn there, they'll put it up for us. Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, God has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he set the world in their heart. Now, boy, you'll just read right past this. This word world is actually the word for eternity. Not sure exactly why they, they translated it this way here. But listen to the, uh, the, the complete Jewish Bible, the CJB. He has made everything suited to its time. Also, he's given human beings an awareness of eternity. He has set eternity in our hearts. We can believe there is eternity. But, but, in such a way that they can't fully comprehend from beginning to end the things that God does. We, we don't understand much about it. Hmm. Um. Uh, God is eternal. His things are eternal. What happens past this life is eternal. Amen. Eternal what? In perpetuity, without ceasing, without end. I want, to ask, I want to ask a very important question, and I want to answer it from the Scriptures. Is everyone going to heaven when they die. Now this is a politically incorrect question. <laughs> hmm? Are y'all with me? And there are all kinds of people who do not believe there is a hell, including Christian people, so called. I, I, I know of certain preachers that preach that there is no hell. But you got people's ideas and you got the Bible. Right? right? Yeah. And if you say, well, I got a right to my opinions and beliefs, actually, as a believer, you don't. Right. You're supposed to believe what he told you. Yes. Right? Yes. And not make up stuff as you go along. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> That's right. What does the Bible say about these things? Look with me in John 3, please. John 3. John 3 and 15, he said that whosoever believes in him should not what? Perish, but have what? Eternal life. Keep going. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What do you understand everlasting to mean? Hmm? 
unceasing, in perpetuity, without end. You can believe that, but in your present state, you don't understand that. You can believe what you don't understand. It's a choice. My father in the faith, Kenneth Hagin, used to say as a little boy, he could not figure out how a brown cow could eat green grass and give white milk. But all the time he's trying to figure it out, he's a drinking the milk. <laughs> you can believe and even enjoy something you don't understand at all. There's all kind of folks in this church had no idea what happened when you turned the key on your car or when you put it in D. <laughs> huh? You got no idea about torque converters and hydraulics and beveled gears and synchros and universal joints and you're like, huh? A lot of folks. But you can enjoy the car and you can get where you're going without understanding. Well, you can believe in eternity and not understand what that means. But go to 17, John 17. And 2, 17th chapter and the second verse. He said, you've given him power over all flesh, Jesus that is, that he should give what? Eternal life to as many as you've given him. Verse 3, and this is life eternal. Here's the definition of what eternal life is. What is eternal life? That they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's not a matter of joining the right church. It's not a matter of the exact correct baptismal formula. Do you know him? Do you know him? And if you really do know him, that shows you've been born again and that shows you have eternal life. And you have passed from death unto life. And you love God and you love people. I didn't say you always acted like you did, but, but it's in you. I said, it's in you. <laughs> Go please to Matthew 25. Jesus talking about this. Now we see these words everlasting. You and I understand that they mean without ceasing. I want you to see the same words used describing something else. Matthew 25 and 41. He said, Then he will say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire. Same word as talking about everlasting life. Wonder what it means. Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46. Verse 46, these shall go away unto everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. These words are some of the very same words. If eternal life means without ceasing, then everlasting punishment means the same thing. Yes. It's the same words. Yeah. Study it for yourself. What does it mean? Does everyone go to heaven when they die? Is there another place people go? Uh, Daniel 12, 2, you don't have to turn there, but Daniel 12, 2 says, uh, uh, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everlasting used both directions. In uh, 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter and the eighth verse, 2 Thessalonians 1 8, they'll put it up for us. It says, In flaming fire, he's going to take vengeance on them that know not God, and they that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, who shall be punished with what? Everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, there are people who say they don't believe there's a hell. And there are people who say, well, no, that doesn't mean everlasting. They're going to be punished and then they're just going to be consumed and it's going to be an end because a, a loving God could not do or allow that kind of thing. 
But whether you understand it or not, uh, whether it, it suits your version of what's righteous or not, should you believe what the Bible says? Yes, you should believe what the Bible says. And I asked the Lord this very question because I knew it would come up. <laughs> I said, Lord, what about this what people say? When people say, how can a God who is love send someone to an everlasting place of punishment, a hell? How can, how can He do that? And uh, I asked Him specifically a few weeks ago, that very question. I said, Lord, I, what do I say? And I didn't, I didn't get anything specific for a few days. The Lord spoke to me one afternoon, excuse me, one evening. I don't mean to heard a voice, but inside me. I asked him again, I said, what do I say about it? He said, it's not my choice. I don't know what that does for you, but man, that, that went all through me. It's reverberating in my insides right now. Why would God send somebody? He said it's not his choice. I just can't believe that. He's a sovereign God. Then you need to read some Bible. Because over and over he told people, I set before you. Didn't he say it? Life, death, blessing, cursing. Then what did he say? You choose. See, people have not understood how far reaching this choice we have goes. He will let you choose even something that results in your own destruction. He will allow you to do that. It's not His will. It doesn't please Him. But it's not His choice. It's your choice. And if you don't choose Him and you don't want Him, where else is there to go? Right? People choose not to be with Him. Well, where, where, where are they going to go? Go with me to uh, Luke, the 16th chapter. Is there a hell? A lot of people today don't believe in it. Even some church going people. I don't know what they do with all these scriptures. <laughs> But, uh, but they don't believe in it. And they formulated their own theories and opinions and doctrines. How many know there needs to be a standard? Yes. Not every man does what's right in his own eyes and what you think and what I think. There's got to be a standard. And you know why a lot of people don't say they don't believe in hell? Because they don't want to believe in hell. Just because you don't want to believe it doesn't mean it's not there. Right? Right? And you don't want to wait till you're out of here to find out how stupid you were. Right? <laughs> Isn't it great? We all got an opportunity right now, right here, this morning. We're alive. We're breathing. Who wants to go see mama in heaven? Come on, come on. All right. Yeah. Let's do it. Luke 16 and 19. Jesus said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Verse 20. There's a certain beggar named Lazarus. Everybody say certain. certain. Now there are people that try to say, well, this passage is a parable. Jesus is speaking allegorically. allegorically. No way is this a parable. Jesus did teach in parables. And every time he did, he'd, he'd say, such and such is like unto yes. such and such. Right? Yes. You don't see that anywhere in this. And when you're talking parables, you don't give the typical people specific names. There was a certain person. And there was a certain person named Lazarus. Hmm? If I said, there was a man lived in Branson named Dave Vaughn, you say, he's telling a fairy tale. That's a parable. No. When you use specific names and you say certain, this happened. This happened. And it gives us a window to look into some things that happened 
past this life after death and some people that don't go to heaven. How many believe the Bible? A certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, keep reading, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, so he had a, a hard life. 22. Came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, now think about it. Lazarus, uh, his body is in the ground, but he's being carried somewhere. Yes. Hmm? This life is not all there is. That's right. And uh, you, th this, this body is just the house you live in right now. Right. And at death, you'll leave this body. Thank Where will you go? People are leaving here. We've been talking about this out of the some nearly, what, seven billion on the planet that we're told that approximately two people die somewhere on the earth every second. Just a little bit over a second, two people. Two people, maybe one in Africa, one in Europe or, or somewhere. I, I mean, okay, two more, two more. Where did they go? They left their body. Where'd they go? Where'd they go? Well, this said he was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and he was buried, verse 23. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. So there is a hell. Yes, there is. I said, there is a hell. Yes. He's seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Keep reading. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. There is a hell. There are flames. There is torment. Right? Yes, sir. And you, you see uh, through this passage, he keeps talking about torment. Torment. He keeps on referring to torment. Torment. Keep reading. Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus received evil things, but now he's comforted and you are tormented. There's a place of comfort. And there's a place of torment after this life. Verse 26, beside all this, there's between us and you, there's a great gulf fix so that they which would pass from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from there. He said, we can't. I can't come to you. I can't do anything for you. Why would God send a man to a place like that? Help me out. It's not his choice. But if you, if you won't choose God, you don't want to be with Him. You don't want to believe in Him. You don't want to accept Jesus. You don't want to accept the salvation and redemption He's provided for us. You got to go somewhere else. Keep reading. He said, I pray you, Father, that you would, if you can't come help me, uh, send Him to my Father's house. That's what we're talking about this morning. People that are past this life, what would they want? Hmm? For their loved ones, their, their sons, their daughters, their grandchildren, what would they want most of all? That they don't want you going to the place of torment. They do want you going to the place of comfort. He said, send them to my father's house, verse 28, because I got five brothers and he can testify to them lest they come to this place of torment. Where is hell? What is it? It's real. I believe the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? If Jesus says there's a hell, then there's a hell. If he says people go to it, then they do. I know folks don't like to believe it. People have made up all kinds of stuff, but I believe the Bible. How about you? One of the scriptures that we talked about said, you know, choose you this day whom you will serve. And Joshua went on to say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right. But whose choice is it? 
It's not God's choice. It's our choice. We're told that hell is beneath us and heaven is above us. There are scriptures that talk about this. Isaiah 14, 9 says, hell from beneath is moved for you to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for thee. The Bible talks about the heart, the heart of the earth. That's the Latin word for core. There's something at the core of the earth. We already know one thing about the core. It is hot. How hot is it? Well, nobody's ever actually been there with a thermometer. But it is estimated to be somewhere around 10 to 13,000 degrees. Some conjecture it could be as hot as the surface of the sun. Natural things reflect spiritual things. There are people there beneath us. Spirits. It's a place of torment. Jesus said, talked about people being cast into hell fire in Mark 9, 47, verse 48. He says, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. The same words everlasting refer to the fire never goes out. Worms won't die. It's everlasting. What is the most important thing we need to decide about hell? I'm not going. Come on, are y'all with me or not? How many think that nobody in this room today should go to hell? Huh? Nobody watching by the internet. And that every mother and grandmother and great grandmother that's in heaven, how many think they ought to get to see their kids? Right? Grandkids great-grandkids, what decides who goes where? Well, we've already talked about we, we got a choice. A choice concerning what? Go to Revelation 20, please. The truth will make you free. You can play ostrich and stick your head in the sand and pretend these things are not real and kid yourself and say, well, maybe later on, right before I die, I'll give my heart to Jesus. And <laughs> What if you get caught off guard? Hmm? What if you ain't got time to, or your mind and heart's not in the right place? Or You got today. You got right now. How many think you ought to take advantage of what you got right now? You're alive. You're breathing. You got a choice. In the uh, Revelation, the 20th chapter. You know, we read this recently in reading our chapters. And if you haven't done it, let me recommend to read these, like these last three chapters in the book of Revelation. They are so powerful. They are, it, it, it gives you a telescopic vision, a telescopic vision into the future. This is not fantasy. This is not imagination. The Lord let John see what's going to happen. And how this thing is going to work. It describes heaven. And this is, not, this, this is not fantasy. He actually saw it. It's real. You're going to see it as a believer. Right? Even if you live another 50, 100 years, it's going to come by like that. You're going to see it. Next thing you know, you're going to be going, wow, look at this. Look, look do you see that? Look at this. It's amazing. And it's a place of comfort. It's a place of love. It's a place that doesn't even need a light bulb or a sun. Because the light of God, who is love and light, lights it all the time. You never even have a night time. What kind of place, what kind of world, what kind of life? Amazing. Wonderful. Everybody ought to go. You believe it? I'm going. How about you? I'm, I'm going. I made up my mind. I've made my choice. I'm going. I'm not going to hell. Wasn't made for me. 
was made for the devil and his crowd and people that don't want God. I do want God. Anybody here besides me? I do. I want him. I want him. Now and forever, I want to be with him. Right? How can we know that we are not going to hell and that we're going to be with him? In Revelation 20 and verse 1, It's a, John said, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. We're going to read a few verses. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. There is a hell and there is a devil. The Bible says so very plainly. Now, forget about everything you ever saw or heard on a Hollywood movie about demons and devils, I mean, it's just a bunch of junk. Don't you believe all that junk? That's not what it's like. It's real, but it's not like that. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years shall be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. Skip on down, uh, next verse. He said, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. You'll see from this passage there are two resurrections and there are two deaths. He said, those that have part of the first resurrection that rule and reign with him for a thousand years, the second death has no power over them. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Somebody say, me, 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 <laughs> me, <laughs> me. That's me. <laughs> Keep going, verse 6. When the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison. And you know what he does? After a thousand years of cooling his heels and getting to think about it, the very same thing he always did, lying, stealing, killing, dirty dog rascal. But it's his last hoorah. Keep going, 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, there is something beyond hell, after hell. It's called the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night. How, how long? Yeah. Same words that describe everlasting life. Same words. Verse 11, I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it. How many believe there is a great white throne? And there is one who sits on it. It is the judge of all the earth. It is the creator of the heavens and the earth. It is the Almighty. We're going to see him. I said, We're going to see him. And when you do, you will not be disappointed. <laughs> From whose face? The earth and heaven fled away and there was no place for them. The, the, the Lord has to bring a, a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great. Well, obviously it wasn't the end of them when they died here on the earth. He's looking at them. Everybody from the least to the greatest, known and unknown. And the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Everybody say the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Does it matter what you do and don't do in this life? It does, and it'll come up after this life. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Keep reading. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. Keep reading. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Who is not going to the place of torment? Those found written in the book of life. That's who. That's who. 
that anybody not found written in the book of life is going to the place of torment, eventually to the lake of fire. I know folks don't like to believe it, but I believe the Bible. How about you? And if you really don't like the idea, I got the solution. (laughs) Make sure your name is in the Lamb's book of life. I got anything to do with it? It's your choice. It's your choice. Back up to the third chapter of Revelation. Third chapter in verse 5. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Who is, whose name's in the Lamb's book of life? The same ones that Jesus confesses before the Father. And we have other words that Jesus said about this in, among other places, Matthew, the 10th chapter in the 32nd verse, put it up, Matthew 10, 32, Jesus said this, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Who's in the Lamb's book of life? The ones that Jesus confesses before the Father. It's the ones that confessed him here in front of men. Right there in the scripture. Verse 33, whosoever shall deny me before men him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. If you won't confess him, if you're ashamed, another account said, if you're ashamed of me and my words before this evil and adulterous generation, it's not okay to be a closet Christian. Hmm? Do you want the Lord to stand up and confess you and claim you in that day we just got through reading about when heaven and earth will flee away from the face of the Almighty. And the only people not going into the lake of fire are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hmm? Do you want to know that you know my name's in that book? He's confessing my name. How would you know that could be, would be so? That you boldly, without reservation, unashamedly confess him here and now before men and are not ashamed. And he said, you do that, you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father and his angels. And Revelation said that those are the ones whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, somebody say glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God. You know, the disciples on one occasion, uh, Jesus had sent them out to cast out devils and heal the sick. And they came back and they said, Jesus, Jesus, even the devils are subject to us in your name. You know what he said? He said, that's great, that's great. But let me tell you what you ought to be happy about. That your name is written in heaven. As great as our miracles and spectacular things and victories can be down here, they pale in comparison to this great truth. When one's name is written in the Lamb's book of life, you are forever a citizen of heaven. You are forever a part of the family of God, sons of the living God that rule and reign with him forever. Not theory, not opinion, Bible. Do you believe it? It is the truth. The scripture said if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you would be saved. Let's affirm or reaffirm our faith. Everybody watching by TV or internet, say it out loud. I don't care if you're the only one in the room. Say it real loud. Maybe the neighbors will hear it. He said, confess me before men, in front of men. Said out loud, Father God, I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he died for my sins. 
I believe you raised him from the dead. And I confess Jesus, my Lord, Lord of my life. I'm not ashamed of you. I believe in you. And I love you. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> he said, those that really do that from their heart, their name is in the Lamb's book of life. And in that day to come, he's going to stand up and just what you did with him, he's going to do it for you in front of the throne, in front of the angels. He's going to call your name and say, he's mine. She's mine. And you won't go to hell. You won't go to the lake of fire. You will stay with him forever and ever in perpetuity without ceasing beyond where you can see. Out of sight. We trust this message has ministered to you. Faith Life Church now has two locations in Branson, Missouri and Sarasota, Florida. Service times in Branson are Friday nights at 6.30 and Sunday mornings at 9 and 11. Service times in Sarasota are Friday nights at 7.30 and Sunday mornings at 10. For more information, please visit our websites, flcbranson.org and flcsarasota.org or call us at 417-334-9233.